Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 279 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the theme of overpopulation in science fiction, and I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and he also oversees John Joseph Adams' books, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He's the series editor of The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, and he's also edited many other anthologies, including Brave New Worlds, a collection of dystopian fiction. So, John, welcome back. Good to be here. The next up, we've got Carrie Vaughn, making her fifth appearance on the show. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling Kitty Norville series about a werewolf who hosts a radio call-in show for supernatural creatures, as well as the recent books Martians Abroad and Amaryllis and other stories. Her new novel Bannerless, about a dystopian future where population control is mandatory, is out now. So, Carrie, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for inviting me. And also joining us today is Maggie Shen King. Her short fiction appears in Asimov's, Ecotone, and Ziziva, and her manuscript Fortune's Fools won second prize in Amazon's 2012 Breakthrough Novel Award. Her debut novel in Excess Mail explores the future consequences of China's one-child policy. So, Maggie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and so, Maggie, since you're joining us for the first time, let's start with you. And have you just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this subject of overpopulation and population control? Um, this all started about five years ago when I opened up the morning newspaper and read a story about the gender imbalance in China that was brought on by the one child policy and the Chinese preference for male children. Um, the topic just blew me over. Um, in, in a natural setting, the, the male female sex ratio is about 100 to 105, 100 women to 105, you know, girls to boys. Um, but because of the one child policy, um, it got as high as 100 to 120 in some rural places in China. And so, um, the statistic is that by the year 2030, 30 million, um, men over the age of 35 will not be able to find wives. And that's about 20% of China's population or about the population, almost the population of Canada. And that's a huge number of people. And, um, uh, as, as, you, as you can imagine, a really, really bad problem. Um, these men are at the peak of their testosterone levels, the, the height of their, their lives. And, um, it become, you, you have a society that's more prone to aggression, more prone to violence and disorderly conduct, uh, on one end of the spectrum. And if they were to go the other way, um, become more dissatisfied and depressed, um, it's not a good makeup for society. And, um, to make the, the, Problem even more interesting. All these men are only children, um, you know, raised um, by doting families, uh, you know, two two parents and four grandparents, and they're used to that kind of attention. And so uh, these these boys who have not had the socialization of of siblings, on um, people they fought over, you know, their entire lives um, are, are placed in this situation. And I just thought um, it was absolutely um, interesting to me. And, uh, a, a, as I thought more about it, I'm, I'm also much pained to discover that this premise for my book, um, held all the necessary elements of, of a classic, uh, dystopian sci-fi novel. Right. How far in the future is your novel set? It's probably, you know, three or four decades in the future. Um, when I started writing the book, uh, they had not started pulling back on the one child policy. And so, I was, you know, operating under, under the assumption that this was going to keep going on. And so, um, I had a society where, um, the, the government has appealed to its families to show patriotism by taking on additional husbands. Um, if, if you think about the whole thing like a mathematical equation, um, to balance that equation, you, you can either, um, bring in more women, you know, foreign wives, or you can export some men, or you could, um, ask, uh, the women to take on additional husbands. And I thought that third, um, third way of solving the, the problem was the most pro provocative and interesting to me. And so that's, um, <laughs> the, the approach I took with my book. Right. And so the protagonist of the novel is one of these 
third husband. So like there's a there's two husbands and a wife already, and he's sort of applying to to join their family. Right. Right. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And then, like, what are some of the? Are there some more sort of science fictional um, elements to the story? Because I saw it looks like um, you have this kind of like war games that people play in the future. Yes, yes. So um, in the book, uh, the well, one of the ways um, the the men try to stay active is to play these war games, and um, it's partly uh, subsidized by the government because because the government wanted to maintain control um, over this population, and and the men um, and, the, and they develop rules and and it's really um, a wilderness training game for men. They get to you know go and work out their 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 extra energy um, in the in the great outdoors, and so it's it's somewhat like laser tag, where. Um, the the men you know use lasers in their sleeves to shoot at each other and their teams and it's a way for the excess males to build community and come together and um but as as the novel progress it becomes a source of contention um um between the government and and the and the excess male and and something bad happens <laughs> i don't <laughs> want to give the plot away but um i think that that came from you know the years and years of me playing uh, or taking my children to to laser tag, and and watching them them play and it's it's really um, you know something the boys really like and get into and and um, it, it's a way to exercise that extra male energy and um, yeah. Right. And I guess I'll mention, too, that uh, the first chapter of the book is available online and I read it. I really enjoyed it. So people, everyone go check that out, too. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the, it's my, my book started out as a short story. Um, and, um, I, after I, I wrote that, I sent it around and it got published in Asimov Science Fiction. Um, and my first chapter actually has that entire story plus one scene that staying with strategic games was actually, um, something I added later. Um, after I went through the entire draft of my, my, I finished my entire first draft, my writing group, um, wanted me to, um, do a little bit more world building, um, bring, bring the, cause, cause I, I started writing this as a marriage tale. And so my focus was very domestic. And they said, you know, please, you know, <laughs> show us the, the bigger world. And that, that scene with the general, um, was, was one that I added later. And, um, I'm so glad I added it because it completely upped the stakes um, for the entire book. And so, yeah, that was really good advice from my writing group. Uh, I'm curious how, how does queerness uh, play into this? Like, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the attitudes towards uh, queer people in, in China is in general, but I'm kind of curious, like given if, if you know, you have a, a, a larger population of, uh, males who, who don't have potential female partners. Um, obviously, you know, uh, we understand that, uh, that being, being gay or queer is, is not a, is not a choice. You're just born that way. So you can't really like, uh, it's like, oh, well, there's no women. I guess I, I'll go be attracted to men. It's not like a choice to make, but, um, I wondered if, um, if, if, if the societal factors are, are, are relevant at all, either in the, either in actual China where, where it's a problem or, or in the, you know, world of the book at all. Um, I think in China, because everybody has just one child, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really problematic for, for parents to, to think that their one child is gay and will not be carrying on the family name. And so mm. there's a great deal of pressure um, for them to marry. And I think it is quite common in China for um, gay men to marry and then um, father child and then carry on like mm. a second life. Um, in my book, because there are so many men, um, they become almost dispensable and China has um it's a very conformist type of society and a, a very proud nation and there's one um one ideal man type you know there's the one one type of men that want to project as 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 a true man and so 
um, you know, they they are very much in favor of that one one image that make makes China proud. And so, um, you know, gays are allowed to live out their lives, but as, as a second tier citizen, mm. they have to register. Um, they're not allowed to reproduce and pass on, you know, whatever, you know, worldview that they possess to, to the younger generation. So that's kind of the premise in my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Yeah. And I want to get Carrie in here as well. So Carrie, why don't you tell us a little bit about Bannerless and sort of how that came about? Yeah, sure. Um, so it started with a short story, uh, Amaryllis, um, which is on Lightspeed, uh, you know, edited by John. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a little hard to talk about in this context because so many different threads came together. It, it's the world has evolved over time. So it started with the short story and then Bannerless uh, is the novel that came out of it. Um, and, and the structure of the novel is a murder mystery, but the world, uh, it's uh, post-apocalyptic. Uh, there's been a kind of cascading failure of civilization. Uh, it's been a little strange in the news lately because I'm watching some of the things that I imagined happening as the prequel to this world. Uh, you know, major disasters that that are where the recovery is very slow. Um, you know, when what happens when you don't have widespread support for recovering from, from your disaster. And, um, you know, what happens when those kinds of things uh, happen in conjunction with uh, an epidemic, uh, you know, something like the Spanish flu, which was so pervasive and, and really affected the population. So I've ended up with a world where uh, the, the people in it are kind of hyper aware of their resources and the limited nature of resources and that they have to preserve um, what they have in order to keep surviving into the future. And and having children is one of those resources that, that you have to make sure that you can take care of the children that you have. So it's a world where, um, you know, permission to have children is, is quite limited because they're, they're so hyper aware of, of exceeding what they have and, and, you know, a, a great fear of, of, uh, exceeding, um, you know, the, their ability to feed the people that they have. And so that's, that's the background of the world. Uh, the Society Awards Banners is where the title comes from, that, that when a household is uh, granted permission to have a child, they're awarded a banner. It becomes uh, very much a badge of honor. Um, you know, when children are born uh, outside of, of this structure, when they don't have permission to have a child and that child is born anyway, they're, they're bannerless and, and it's a mark. Um, you know, they're, they're not, they're taken care of. They're still taken care of, but the household is, is punished. They're usually broken up. Um, you know, the parents uh, sent away. Um, and that mark stays with them in the way that uh, shame culture kind of works, that, that once a household has done something wrong, once once a person kind of has that mark on them, it's really hard to get away from. Um, and that's what Amaryllis was about. And uh, uh, Bannerless um, is about a smaller community uh, where someone has died mysteriously and kind of confronting some of those uh, societal issues of, of, you know, who fits in and who doesn't and, and how does that get handled. So yeah, it's it's a little complicated. Uh, it would, if I have to talk about where it came from, you know, not there's the post-apocalyptic threads, there's the the resource management, the kind of environmental threads, but also I, I wanted to build a society where people asked why why do you want children? I mean, we live in a society where people ask why don't you want children? You know, if mm -hmm. you don't have kids. Uh, if you don't want kids, you're you're sort of forced to explain yourself. Uh, you know, type it into Google. You know, why don't people have kids? Why don't people want kids? And you get so many more articles than you do people trying to explain why they do want kids. Um, whereas in in Bannerless, it's it's a world where people are forced to explain why they do want children rather than why they don't. Now, is this banner system? Is this something that you see as like a dystopian government? um oppression or do you see this as kind of like a necessity given the dire circumstances of this world i i see it a, a little bit as a necessity um given what has happened in this world i see it as, as a natural outgrowth of the people who lived through the collapse and the apocalypse um trying to come up with something that works better than what came before uh, rather than just kind of scrabbling along um and and of course you know, especially immediately after the the apocalypse. I've got a short story coming out uh, from Tor.com that's kind of a prequel. 
and you know so hyper aware of how little they have and and then you know kind of being paranoid about the birth of children you know we can't take care of these kids so how do we manage that i don't see it as a, a government oppression because there's really not a whole lot of government in this world i see it as a bottom up um, it's it's more uh, community peer pressure uh, to not have children. Um, I was introduced uh, to a concept of social engineering um, that what do people believe? What do they believe is is right? What do they believe is correct? What is the culture? And if you can you know, develop a culture where you know automatically having children where where unlimited reproduction is not the norm. Um, then it becomes kind of a, a self-governing kind of thing that, that neighbors are looking out for each other. Everybody's kind of policing each other rather than having it be an authoritarian system because the, the government system in, in Bannerless is not authoritarian. There's not, uh, you know, a president. There's not uh, uh, a centralized governing body. It's it's a system of committees um, kind of all, all up and down this, this region. And, the, you know, the committees change out members and they all work with each other. Um, so it's a little more socialist than that, um, I, I guess, if I had to put a name to it. Um, but it is, you know, the, the, the power of peer pressure, I think, is really uh, a lot more than people would, uh, than we like to give it credit for, <laughs> you know. Uh, listening to Maggie talk about her, uh, the, the one child policy in China, uh, it's so interesting to me that the gender imbalance isn't natural. It comes from the technology of being able to identify the sex of children before they're born um, so that parents can terminate the pregnancies of girls because they want boys. And and so that's an example of social engineering. You know, you've got a society where boys are so much more valued, added to the technology of being able to determine the sex of the child before birth and then terminating an unwanted pregnancy. You know, that's that's so fascinating to me, <laughs> you know, that that's, you know, without that technology, the, the gender ratio would would be normal um so so that fascinates me just the way that that people govern themselves and communities govern themselves yeah well i mean i mean john you uh, published this uh, novel right do you mm -hmm. want to add anything to what carrie's saying about it uh, sure yeah well and i was just going to say also that you know i as carrie mentioned i originally published the first story amaryllis and then i reprinted it in my anthology brave new worlds um and i just reread it uh for the first time in a long time um you know certainly the first time after i bought bannerless the novel um and i thought and i thought it was interesting to sort of revisit it and and look back and like i see i had a header note at the start saying where it's like well i'm not actually really sure how dystopian this is but yeah. <laughs> it, it is it is a matter of um perspective though like yes, certainly yes. to um the main character of amaryllis's uh mother uh she may have felt it was dystopian that that her rights were being oppressed in some way she chose to have a bannerless child um and then you know in the in the book bannerless um and then in the sequel and such, you know, it's, you know, other people are rebelling against that sort of element of society. So I think it's interesting to sort of talk about it in a dystopian context, even though it's like, yeah, when you look at it, it's not really that dystopian. I mean, in a lot of ways, um, a lot of ways I'm when I'm reading Bannerless, the novel, I feel like geez, this is like kind of um, idyllic. It's like I almost want to live here. I mean, I, I would miss the Internet for sure. But um you know, there's something about the simplicity of the society that they live in where, you know, everyone just contributes a certain amount and, and in in exchange for what they contribute, they get, you know, provided for. And and that whole system of, um, you know, quotas and everything like just it, it, it feels like it, it would just take so much of the stress of modern society away <laughs> um, in, in one way. And the other and the other side of things is like, well, if if you're not good at farming or whatever then like you know maybe you're not a very useful member of this society you know so um uh i mean unless you can do other things like uh play music or whatever and you can you know make your career that way but um you know it's just it's it's a really interesting world um and uh i, I should also say um so we're talking about the book banner list but uh and you know carrie as carrie noted the 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 world started in amaryllis but um there was also a short story called bannerless uh, that I published in my anthology, The End Has Come. And it's interesting to sort of, and we sort of borrowed the title banner list for the novel because we, it just, because it fit that also, but it was also a really great novel title. Um, but it was interesting uh, to go back and reread that one also because the short story banner list is basically 
uh, toward the end of Enid's career, Enid's the protagonist of Bannerless, um, it's it sh it's basically at the end of her career, whereas the novel Bannerless is basically right at the start of her career. So, um, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, my medieval reenactor friends all want to <laughs> live there. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Um, so yeah, that that when I announced that Amaryllis was being reprinted in uh uh you know Brave New Worlds this this dystopian anthology, mm -hmm. people were like, but it's, <laughs> it seems like such a nice place. Why why would yeah. you do that? But the the right to reproduce is so fundamental that that when you start messing with it, um, it 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 gets very emotional. Um, and and I I've talked with people about that as well that that gets brought up that it's um, yeah we shouldn't be messing all that much with the right to reproduce because then you start getting the questions of well who's deciding and who gets to and who doesn't and um and and uh, bad things happen <laughs> when right. you start answering those questions well right like mac you said that you read the these two stories by carrie right what did you think of this sort of bannerless uh child allocation system it, it's very interesting i carrie brought up a few things that i wanted to talk about too on um the power of peer pressure, um, citizens kind of policing each other. Um, in, in China, um, they had birth monitors who, um, you know, every, every, every province was given a birth quota and it got, you know, distributed down to the grassroots level. And, um, the, the monitors, they, they had monitors who were in charge of like a group of women say, say 25, and they would chart, um, and it, it got very intrusive. They would like chart people's menstrual cycles. They would figure out what, um, contraceptions you were using. Um, they would, um, you know, based on how many births they were allowed, they were, they would tell people when they think they could marry, when they could have children and people had to apply for, um, birth certificates and permission. And, um, it, it, it was, you know, the, the, the way they, they managed population was, was just really scary when you, when you think about it. And then, um, after, uh, if, if you were to get pregnant and not, uh, have permission, then they can, you know, come to your house and, and, um, you know, try to convince you to have an abortion. And if you're not cooperative, um, Sometimes they will take away your, your means of whatever means you have for making a living. So say you were a farmer and, uh, you needed your cow. They could confiscate your cow. They could go to your workplace and, um, and, you know, take away your promotions or bonuses or whatever coming along or, you know, put your mother in jail and, and make you pay for her meals. Um, and it, you know, it, it wasn't just, the the officials you know who are enforcing it, it seemed like sometimes the citizens were involved and and it, at times it felt like everyone was culpable for for these these practices and um you talked about Carrie talked about the ultrasound coming in as as a good way to self police um and you know in some ways the ultrasound was probably the worst thing to ha to happen to china um when when g e invented the portable ultrasound and it, that was around the year 2002. Um, it could take in, be taken into the small villages and, and abortions could, could take place. And that's when the sex ratio got really, really skewed. But, but prior to that, um, because of the preference for male children, you know, before that, you know, when, when the girls are born, you know, sometimes they're given away for adoption, um, if they're lucky or allowed to stay to, to live. But sometimes, um, you know, these infanticide would happen. You know, girls would be taken out and drowned or, um, you know, if you, you could get, um, an exception, um, uh, if you had a disabled child, so someone would try to maim the, the girl child so that they would, you know, have the ability to have another child. So, um, you know, the, the, the peer pressure in China was, was intense and, um, I don't think it, it, it was a cooperative situation. I don't know in, in Carrie's, um, a novel, um, what was it more benevolent? This, this, um, ability to, to monitor each other and, and, um, work for a common good. Yeah. I, I, 
organized it by household specifically. So the banners aren't given to individual people. They're given to households. And then within the household, they decide, um, mm -hmm. you know, who's going to have the child and, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And, and that, um, you know, it doesn't mitigate it entirely, but it is, uh, you know, sort of a, a little bit of democracy within the, the, mm -hmm. the greater system. So human nature was, was, was good and kind. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it, it is. It, it was, you know, what, what if we actually learned from our mistakes? What if mm -hmm. we had a group of people who, who saw what happened during an apocalypse and said, Hey, let's, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. <laughs> you know, what, what mm -hmm. would happen then? So yeah, it's, it's a little upbeat, but I think we need a little upbeat these days to kind of counter. <laughs> Some of the grim dark that's been uh, pervasive lately. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just sort of curious, Maggie. In China, is the one-child policy you mentioned that it was sort of repealed or whatever in 2015? Is it um, viewed as just a total catastrophe, or does or, or is there a contingent that has more complicated feelings about it in China? I think um, the the population growth was managed, but. Um, some people would argue that it was not because of the one child policy, um, but because, um, Deng Xiaoping, you know, opened, opened the doors to special, they opened e special economic zones for foreign investments. And, um, they actually also had one of the largest labor forces. And so those conditions make it ripe for, you know, some of the most, uh, amazing economic growth, um, of, of the century. Um, so, you know, in that, and in, in that, so, so it, I think it could be argued that it was helpful, but it was not the contributing factor. Um, but, um, you know, the one child policy was originally formulated to be like a one generation, um, stopgap. And, um, it was supposed to stabilize the population, but in fact, I don't think it did. Uh, you know, there were so many unintended consequences. One, of course, is the 30 million excess males. Um, there's also a problem called the, the hey hai is a problem, which, you know, roughly translates into shadow children. And this is, um, a group of, um, of, uh, they're usually girl children who, um, because the parents are trying to save um, the household registration, everybody got one for a child, try to save that household registration for a son. Uh, they did not register their firstborn daughters. And so these um, daughters uh, became unregistered and they're illegal and they cannot go to school. They cannot uh, go to the hospital to get medical care. They have no legal rights. Um, and there are about 13 million of them. Um, from from the last census and so you know you now have this uh underclass of um un unregistered uh uneducated people who you know is another problem for society um and another unintended consequence is that um because there's so few there are fewer um children born in 20 years there's only about one and a half um working adult to uh, one retiree and for a, you know, sustainable society, you need four or five working adults to, to support the uh, elderly. And so they have this tsunami, uh, of elderly people, um, who, who are going to be, um, inundating the society. So the, the population composition has just gotten, um, very, very strange and, and un unsustainable. So, you know, the one child policy, yes, it did bring down population, but it created a host of unintended consequences. It's so funny because these things that you're talking about, I think would strike so many Americans as something out of a dystopian science fiction mm -hmm. story. Is, is that, did you have that reaction when you were researching a lot of this stuff? Like, oh, this just seems like something out of science fiction. Exactly. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's something that you, you just can't imagine. And you imagine it's like, oh, how could you possibly do this? Right. This um, you know, evolution figured out the, the right, um, uh, birth ratio. And w once you mess with it, then, you know, all kinds of, uh, <laughs> things you can't predict happens, right? And, uh, and, and one more unintended consequence is that, um, you know, it created this area for corruption. Um, 
you know, the, the local birth officials had the right to make exceptions. And so, um, the, the birth, if you don't, um, if you have an illegal child, the, the fine is like something like three times your annual income. So it's really hard for the average person to pay. And if you don't pay, it compounds annually. Hmm. And so there's this huge fine, um, out there and the government has been collecting fines. And plus, um, the local, um, officials have been collecting bribes. And so China's made, you know, 300 some million dollars, according to the New York Times from the inception of the policy. And so you have, um, you know, this area of corruption plus, you know, all kinds of human emotional costs that, uh, that, that you can just imagine. So it's, it's, uh, it sounds like, it sounds like dystopian fiction, but in actuality, you know, China was the one nation that had the, um, political system and, 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 and the wherewithal to, to enforce, uh, to enforce the policy. So yeah, 40 years of, uh, 40 years of this is, is very, very scary to think about. Mm. Well, I want to ask John, too, because in, I know in preparation for this panel, speaking of all this dystopian science fiction, you you said that you went back and looked at kind of the history of uh, overpopulation in science fiction. Do you, uh, when you go back and look at that stuff, do you feel like uh, science fiction got it right or got it wrong? Or what's the kind of track record with that? Uh, yeah, you know, and I, I can't claim that I did any kind of extensive survey, but, um, you know, uh, the science fiction and Encycl science fiction encyclopedia, which is an online, um, you know, resource, uh, has an entry on overpopulation in science fiction. And so I just sort of started there and looked at a few things. And so, um, I can't say that anything from like the old days, uh, really felt like it really predicted anything well or, or ho holds up today. Um, like there's stories like the census takers by Frederick Pohl, uh, who, and you know, Frederick Pohl is obviously, a, a one of the great science fiction writers, uh, in history. And, um, but that story like doesn't hold up at all. Um, and like Kurt Vonnegut has a couple and, uh, some of his are, some of those were okay, but, um, like welcome to monkey house is interesting and it ha and it's definitely, you know, it's on, it's on the subject, but, um, it doesn't really have like a lot of interesting ideas like or or solutions like and nothing really even had a solution it was all it, all of these stories were were mostly just like considering that overpopulation may become a serious problem um without really um uh considering how to fix anything um well and, they were all cautionary so, tales right yeah 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 they're all cautionary tales and so um i mean the only the only one that i think of that i that i um encountered uh in, in doing all this research was one that i already knew about which was bilenium by jg ballard which is in brave new worlds it, it's like that one actually feels like it's a classic story that actually uh engages with the issue in a, in a pretty interesting way and the um and the uh the the pro the, the as a story it holds up as a modern reader like I can read it and 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 not have it feel like it's it's this ancient piece of text that I discovered that uh, that doesn't really uh, resonate for a modern reader but um but but that one too is just a cautionary tale it doesn't have any solutions or anything yeah and um, I'll I'll tell you the the problem I had with that story you know it's it's a it's a yeah. great story but it felt allegorical to me mm -hmm. um and and something I I run into with a lot of you know, encountering these stories is they, they treat the entire planet like a monoculture. Mm -hmm. Like they sort of pre presuppose that we've gotten to a point where every place on earth is the same. Um, whereas that's not true right now, <laughs> you know, right. and you know, there, there are different birth rates in different countries and there are different ways of handling it and there's different issues. And I find that the whole treatment of, of overpopulation in science fiction says a lot more about the fears of, the authors and the audience than it does about an actual situation. Um, you know, especially if you start digging into like, uh, you know, the Malthusian ideas and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, another a book that came out in the seventies that, that was a big part of the environmental mu movement. And I think was pretty influential on a lot of people's thinking, uh, the limits to growth, um, which I think that encyclopedia of science fiction um, article mentions, um, mm -hmm. you know, this idea that the, the population is going to explode, but, but the resources aren't going to be there. Um, I, you know, I find it a, a really, um, you know, I think Malthus was writing in the late 18th century. So it's kind of concurrent with the industrial revolution and the urbanization of populations. You know, it, 
these fears start coming out when you start getting a bunch of populations moving into cities. Um, you know, and it, it's not always a fear of, of, of increasing population in general. It's, it's, you know, increasing the wrong kinds of populations, you know, quote unquote wrong. Um, that, that, yeah, there, there's a lot of, it, you can really psychoanalyze it if you want to. <laughs> you, you can dig into there and say, yeah, that, I, I'm not sure this is about a, an actual situation so much as it is about some, um, you know, some very specific fears having to do with industrialization. Well, mm -hmm. well, right. I mean, because I would say that the overpopulation science fiction that I'm familiar with, I mean, I'm, it does seem to me that overpopulation is a big problem and the modern world has all sorts of problems. But when you compare it to a lot of these science fiction treatments where there's like literally not any place to sit because there are so many people mm -hmm. and a strawberry right. costs a thousand dollars and stuff, it does seem that science fiction historically has been either alarmist or allegorical, mm -hmm. as you were saying. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting in the middle of the story, in the J.G. Ballard story, when they discover that that huge room next door, mm -hmm. that, you know, once they start to enjoy it, and the next thing is like, oh, you know, it felt very human. Why don't we invite our girlfriends over, you know, and then give them a space? And then once the girlfriends um, got established, they wanted to bring their parents, and it was, okay, come on, you know, keep bringing them keep bringing it felt like a very human and inclusive story until I got to the end and and I realized he was charging the rent <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but that that wardrobe as, as a symbol of um you know at, at the end they they had they had this beautiful victorian wardrobe um that symbolized like beauty and freedom and um and privacy and it was it was a really nice image when they started you know, taking that apart and, and, and making more room for, uh, for people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that's the allegory there. Uh, and it was really funny kind of reading that one of the other pieces we talked about when we were um, prepping for this was the, uh, the movie that's on Netflix now, what happened to Monday, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which I, I didn't find very satisfying. And one of the reasons, especially in, in, in reading it in conjunction with millennium where, um, space is at such a premium and then i'm watching uh you know what happened to monday and everybody's got these nice 1200 square mm -hmm. foot loft apartments that everybody <laughs> in hollywood always has uh hmm. for what you know because it's hollywood we need to get the cameras in there it needs to look nice and it's like you know if this was a really overpopulated world i don't think everybody would have mm -hmm. these really nice apartments mm -hmm. um you know just a little detail that was that was kind of funny just in conjunction um, with that one story. Well, well, let's just for people, let's just describe the premise, because I, I agree with you. I was really underwhelmed by the movie, but I thought it had a fantastic premise. And, and the premise is that it's in the future and there's like a one child policy in effect. And so this guy ends up with septup twi identical septuplet um, granddaughters and yeah, decides the, to raise them. Um, raise Willem Dafoe plays the grandfather. Yeah. And decides to raise them all in secret, and and they're each gonna pretend, and they're gonna pretend to all be one person, and so each of them is named Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, etc. And they each only go outside one day of the week. That's the day of their name. I just I thought that was a terrific premise. I mm -hmm. I thought it mm -hmm. really failed to deliver on that premise. Yes. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, I thought that it was really interesting, and, and my and it was I was like really I was more into it at first, and then my interest sort of waned as the movie went on, and toward the end of the movie, it kind of becomes a kind of a dumb action movie. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I also ha I had so many issues with their methodology of like how they were going to keep everything secret. I was like, there's no way. Like I, that must have been the most soundproof apartment in the history of soundproof apartments. <laughs> Not because... only that, but we're yeah. supposed to believe that he took care of seven babies all by mm -hmm. himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know very few people who can take care of one baby all by themselves. Yeah. And, and we're supposed to believe <laughs> that he actually uh, managed to, to raise them all. Because, uh, you know, you can't bring anybody in at that point because you're not allowed right. to have you know, multiple children. Yeah. And where's the mom? I mean, there, there's, it, it <laughs> well, didn't there, she there's die? the missing, I thought, I, thought she, well, I thought she died in childbirth or something. Yes, isn't that isn't, why he ended up with her? Isn't that a trope I'm tired of at this point? Well, sure. You know? <laughs> I thought that it was very interesting that, you know, each child got to go out, but at the end of the day, they had to come home and debrief everybody. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that everybody yeah. was up to speed on what, what happened out there, all, every single interaction. And then that one instance where one of the girls came home with a lopped off finger, 
Mm -hmm. And then the grandfather had to chop off everybody's finger. <laughs> so yeah. Like, ah! See, see, yeah. now that was a, that was an interesting detail. But then, like, I don't understand the need to make it like Chekhov's fingertip. Yeah. That that, mm -hmm. that you then had to actually like uh, actually fire the gun with Chekhov's fingertip uh, later in the in the movie. It's like that was so stupid. <laughs> and and like even if you even if you felt the need to actually do that, like how how did how did she put the fingertip on her finger? Oh, like, she had well, the she taped it. She, she did a well, paper it was clip. it was ridiculous though. So so yeah, to to explain that that the the, <laughs> the bad guys have these biometric guns so that it reads their fingerprint or something and only they can fire it. So there's this and it's Numi Rapace who's the the woman you know pulling a an orphan black thing where she's playing all seven of them. And and yeah, I I actually I thought that was clever. I liked that. <laughs> it, well, it was gross. I mean, the point of it was to be gross. Yeah. You know, that she has yeah. to cut off the guy's finger and then stick it on her own john you, you can't underestimate thing. how good duct tape is going to be in the future <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there was also a pin she poked into her finger yeah that? right there, there was a but lot that, of blood that sound is painful going on. yeah there was just a lot of weird problematic things where it's like okay well i i was kind of buying into all this but then i it was like nah i don't know <laughs> it doesn't really fly no but what you're saying john like i think the whole problem with it is that it was in dumb action movie and i i the, yeah. like a lot of the script was so intelligent and then all, yeah. so much of the rest of it was so dumb i was wondering if there were different competing people or you know powers uh fighting over what it should be but i think it should have been i mean it's not an act just the premise it's not an action movie it's a suspense thriller right and i thought it should right. have been just like their only kit you know because it's, it's it's so impossible that she could have made it to 30 years old doing this mm -hmm. i thought it, i thought it should have started it's it's just about them as kids and they go to they have to go to school for the first time and keep it all secret and that would mm -hmm. be i think be a real like slightly more believable and really really tense suspense thriller mm -hmm. which is what i think it should have been yeah, and I mean, it would have been almost impossible to imagine the kids actually succeeding, right? I mean, so it's like it's hard to imagine you even got to her being an adult. Yeah, and it, and you know, as far as the the topic of overpopulation, the the, the film didn't really engage with that. But, you know, that mm -hmm. that was there to set up the premise, not mm -hmm. to be dealt with in any kind of meaningful way. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was most, like, I, I was actually really interested when someone, uh, mentioned, like, you know, we had posted that we were doing this panel and, and, um, and so one of our listeners had suggested this movie and I just thought it was like actually kind of this weird, fun coincidence that we happened to decide to do this panel completely independently of that movie. And yet here's this like 2017 movie that's totally inspired by overpopulation. So, um, that was kind of a happy, uh, uh, accident. But uh, it, it's like it, the movie made me it kept reminding me of Gattaca, but it was oh, like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, but it's like it, it's like it didn't learn anything from Gattaca. Yeah. It's just it's just they, they saw Gattaca and they really liked it and they wanted to make a movie like that. It's but because they didn't really the, learn why it was good. Right, the, the scan. It's because the scanning is exactly like it was on Gattaca. You yeah. know, you walk through the checkpoint mm -hmm. and you, it, you know, it gets your little DNA sample and then the, the screen up there with the picture. It's like I think it was they think they may have actually borrowed the scanning screens. <laughs> Gattaca. I have to go back and look now. But just and just my other criticism of this movie is that the bad guys are way too evil and mm -hmm. the good and bad is way too black and white and cut <laughs> and dry. You know, mm -hmm. like if because because to, to me, like the, the thing with overpopulation in science fiction is that if you treat it like a real problem and the question is, like, how far are you willing to go to grapple with this real problem? I think that's really interesting. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's just like, oh, no, it's just like a, we can just like do whatever. It doesn't matter. It, it just deflates all the tension and all the interesting ethics from the whole yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the areas where I, I start to be suspicious of it as a problem at all. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the World Health Organization has a lot of statistics out there that when, when women have access to education and birth control, they have fewer children. Um, when, you know, a, a society has economic stability, they have fewer children. So there are ways in which you know people do self-regulate their population. You know, it, it's you know Malthus had this idea that population was was completely out of control, out of human control. It was just going to to continue to be explosive, and it was going to come faster and faster, and the population is going to double over and over again, and it's just going to be awful. You know, when in fact the the real world statistics don't actually bear that up um, in in some really interesting ways. So just throwing that out there. Well, right. I was listening. I, I just to, just for research for this, I just started listening to a podcast called the the Overpopulation Podcast. I only listened to the first episode, but they were saying that in that in Singapore, they actually succeeded in bringing the birth rate down to 
1.5 per family or something just mm -hmm. through education and mm -hmm. handing out condoms to everybody and stuff like that. Yeah, it turns out women don't want to be pregnant all the time in most cases. You know? <laughs> so, so China um, started pulling back on their one-child policy. It's now a two-child policy, and they've, um, you know, done some surveys and, and and they found out, you know, the the cost of having a second child is actually very high, and only about thirty percent of the population, you know, after years of, you know becoming used to having one child, you know, only about 30% of the population are actually interested in having more children. And, um, you know, the declining birth rate is a real problem now in first world countries in Europe yep. and um, mm -hmm. many, many parts of the world. Yeah. So yeah, we're Japan. actually going the other way. Yeah. Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Maggie, you mentioned the, this interesting issue of if you decrease the population too quickly, do you not have enough young workers to take mm -hmm. care of, to do all the work that you need to support the elderly. But then that's sort of intersecting with this other trend of automation taking away all the jobs. Mm. So it does make me wonder if in the future, there's just going to like the, you know, you're just going to have this elderly population uh, being cared, cared for by robots, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a story out there that sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, a lot of these older um short stories on, on population problem. Uh, I think no one's really taken into account. Oh, I don't know if John's read anywhere. Um, technology really comes through to solve problems, right? Um, you know, with contraception and education, then, you know, the, 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 the need to practice moral restraint kind of goes away. Um, and then with, with the, the new technologies and, and farming, you know, we are able to produce, mass produce a lot more food. Um, have you have you seen short stories out there where they predicted um, uh, like like a new world where, you know, so much of this is possible? Um, not really that comes to mind, but I mean, um, like so. So one of the stories that uh, I, I looked at was this this story called "The Big Space Fuck" by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, it was in it was originally in, in uh, again Dangerous Visions, and so it's not really about overpopulation. It's like kind of like the opposite, but it kind of gets close to like like a technological solution. I mean, and like in this story, it's like basically it's like we're so eager to uh, procreate that we're just like uh, taking our DNA, although it's more crude in the story, and, and we're firing it into the stars, like hurling it towards Andromeda in order to try to, you know, literally spread our seed amongst the stars. Um, and so it's like, so, I mean, that it's like a ridiculous story, but I mean... Um, Except Star Trek Next Generation used that in an episode. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but, but, um, but, you know, the idea that in science fiction, you know, we could say, okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to address our problem of, of, of overpopulation. We're just going to find new worlds to colonize and, you know, take all mm -hmm. of our people to those worlds and populate those worlds and, and we'll solve the problem that way. I mean, that is a technological solution, mm -hmm. Yeah, but... Um, but you know, not as easy, uh, much, much, uh, much easier said than done. I mean, you know, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of habitable worlds in our, in our solar system, uh, that we can reach presently, obviously. So, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy solution, but it is, it is at least a science fictional solution that we could explore. I can't really think of many stories that, that take that as like the particular impetus to get us out among the stars. Um, it's possible that that's a, that's in the background of something, but, um, nothing that, uh, it's like feels like it's the overwhelming, um, a reason for it. There is this, John, there's this Asimov short story. I can't remember the title of it, but basically, and it, it, it actually name checks Malthus in the story. Mm -hmm. But it's basically it's it's the the solution to overpopulation is parallel worlds, right? So they figure out ways to mm. open doorways to parallel worlds, and then humanity can spread to all the parallel worlds. Oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Well, there's a... uh, I mean, that, yeah, that sounds more interesting than any of the ones that I read uh, in preparation for this. I mean, ex aside from present company, you know, <laughs> there, there's a colonization <laughs> issue, though. It's, it's I I don't remember that story. Is, are there people in these parallel worlds that we're opening up mm. to to? Well, in, in this the one, they, op they they specifically open doorways to deserted worlds. Okay. But then it turns out, from what I remember, that there are some sort of like, there's some sort of weird alien presence that starts seeping into the, through the, mm. you know, back through the gate. It's, I read it, you know, a long time ago. I don't remember the yeah, details. See, but... There's always unintended consequences. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to note, though, what, speaking of what Maggie was saying about the, um, you know, increasing um, agriculture and so on, because... 
there was a book, I think in the 70s, by Paul Ehrlich called The Population Bomb, which my mm -hmm. understanding is that that's what really kickstarted a lot of the concern about overpopulation. And um, his pr projection, his projections were basically that there was going to be mass starvation because the population was rising so much faster than the uh, food production ability. But then I think what happened was that there was the invention of ammonium nitrate fertilizers, which like, yeah, like tripled or whatever the uh, uh, capacity to um, produce food. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people look at that and say, oh, and, and sort of say like, oh, we should never be concerned about this because there will always be some technological solution. Look, it happened that time. It'll it's it'll happen in the future. And that kind of thinking makes me really nervous. I mean, I hope there's always a technological solution. But given that we only have one planet and mm -hmm. one human mm -hmm. civilization, you know, well, I, I would I would like to strike a little bit more of a balance between <laughs> prudence and optimism. And and that seems more the concern now that I, I don't hear a lot of people talking about overpopulation in itself, but in, in mm -hmm. conjunction with uh, climate change and energy use and global warming and all these other issues, which, uh, you know, that that's kind of more characteristic of, of our current era is that we look at all these problems in conjunction with each other. Uh, whereas I think earlier they were you know, kind of strictly looking at population versus food production when there's there's all of these other issues as well. Like at this point now, I think a lot of people feel like, you know, we the, we may the population uh, issue is going to take care of itself if we don't take care of some of these other uh, problems first. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, and and that does kind of drive me a little crazy, Carrie, when people talk about how overpopulation was a completely overblown concern when when they're not taking into account uh, the mass extinction of so many other species on this planet right, that have happened right. in the last few decades. Um, but well, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, mm -hmm. so let's let's talk then maybe about some more of these science fiction things because um, Maggie, you said that you watched uh, Star Trek: uh, Mark of Gideon, right? Yes. And I wanted to talk about that because I think that's a really interesting exploration of the idea of overpopulation as a result of uh, immortality, basically. You know, that mm -hmm. if you get mm -hmm. rid of disease and, you know, extend lifespans and so on, then isn't overpopulation just inevitable at that point? Yes. Um... I mean, could you just just, just talk about how, what, what did you think of that episode? Did you like it? Um, yeah, it was kind of fun to watch. Um the 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 placement onto this when 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 the the girl i forget her name is it Linda? Like Madonna or something yeah Madonna. first first came on and um she was dancing and and, <laughs> and um you know you you contrast her world where everybody is crowded together with her alone on the spaceship and feeling that sense of space you know <laughs> that was really really mm -hmm. wonderful imagery um, and then the, the idea that there would be one person who's willing to sacrifice herself for her community, come on, contract, um, an illness so that she could die and perhaps go back and spread that germ <laughs> so that more people could die. That, that was kind of an interesting altruistic, uh, uh, inclination. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting how often uh, some of these uh, original series Star Trek episodes actually just like feel like something that a contemporary audience can can grapple with and, and enjoy in a way that some of the classic science fiction stories that I, I was looking at didn't. Right. Um, and this was this was a case where it's like, wow, like that that was like surprisingly um like felt like surprisingly like a modern story to me um and you know it's like you know there's 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 moments of it where it's like it's a you know it's very star trekky but it's like it um and, and shows its age a little bit but i mean it, it worked surprisingly well given i mean from the 60s or, or whatever whenever that episode aired um so yeah i mean i have to i always have to give them props for that right and i was gonna say i think that what's interesting about it to me too is that it raises this issue of what like, what is the balance between quantity of lives versus quality mm -hmm. of life, right? Like, is mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. is it better to have, you know, a hundred people all crowded together in a room where they can just sort of, they're just sort of standing there and they can barely move or like 10 people in that same room and they can move around and dance mm -hmm. and, and whatever. And, you know, how do we make that determination and where does life become? Cause, because this is the thing. I mean, it's a sort of an interesting question, but if you do... Uh, institute uh, population controls, even uh, relatively benign ones, you are having lots of people not being born. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, how do we feel about that? You know, like if we if we because because this like this overpopulation podcast I was listening to, they said that really in order to have a sustainable um, you know, to, to use our resources sustainably, we, we should really be looking at bringing the Earth's population down to between one and three billion, which is less than half of what it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how do we feel about having half as many people on Earth as there are now? Mm-hmm. Are we going to miss those people, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there are people who make the argument that we can support a lot more people than we do now um, because of increased uh, food capacity and decreasing per capita energy use is, is another statistic that, that gets thrown out there. Um, but it, it, it's also, you know, what are, what are you used to putting up with? What are we willing to put up with? You know, there's a judgment call there between, you know, living in cities versus living in the countryside. You know, how much room does one person really need? Um, you know, the other interesting thing about the, the J.G. Ballard story is, is, you know, I'm looking at that where people are living under the stairs and there's 10 people to mm-hmm. a room. There are people in the world living like that right now. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's not evenly distributed. That that's why that you know the whole treating the, the planet like a monoculture thing doesn't really ring true to me because it's like I'm reading this going, yeah, there are people living like this right now. Um, and I think they would say, you know, if the alternate was if the alternative was to not live at all, you know, they would pick ten people to a room. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is you know I, I I haven't done enough reading into this. I but I would be interested in, in, you know, how much of of these fears started coming about, you know, at the Industrial Revolution, where people are, are suddenly, every you know, everyone was moving to cities and you have, uh, you know, slums for the very first time, um, or at least, you know, slums at, at that scale for the very first time and people deciding, well, that's not a good way to live. Um, well, you know, it's it's better than not living. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and there's a lot of research being done now into, you know, ways to, you know, grow food in cities with hydroponics and things like that and ways to make cities, um, you know, quote unquote livable. Um, but yeah, it, it, so much of it feels like a judgment call to me. Um, you know, if your ideal, you know, if your own personal ideal is, is a two acre farm with, with your own goats and chickens and, and plenty of space and fresh air, uh, you know, of course, um, a crowded city is going to look bad. Um, but if you're used to the crowded city, you know, there's a lot of resources you have there that you don't have in the country. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, these are all, um, yeah, a, a lot of these discussions, I, I often feel like they say more about the people making them than they do. Hmm. I, I'm not sure there's an empirical answer to any of this, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, so the, the Mark of Gideon uh, uh, feels like it, it leads directly into discussing uh, Paolo Bacigalupi's Pop Squad, yeah, uh, which yeah. is another story that was in Brave New Worlds, um, you know, because it's kind of a similar situation where, you know, you have immortality leading to issues of overpopulation. And in Paolo's story, um, the Pop Squad is uh, actually like a group of um, basically kind of bounty hunters who go around looking for illicit children uh, because the 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 offset of being able to have immortality is that then you are not allowed to reproduce um and so um well actually i mean i guess even even the people i guess the people have to be off of the immortality juice in order to reproduce at all and so just reproducing at all is is banned and so you know it's their job to actually go around and like pop the kids <laughs> you know so it's a, a very dark and and graphic story but um I think it's an interesting sort of companion uh, piece to talk about with Mark of Gideon, since they kind of end up in a similar situation where they have immortality uh, co- ending up causing all these problems. It seems like they've created somewhat of a utopia for, for the people who are willing to go mm-hmm. along, right? Take the Riju, become younger, live forever. But then um, the, the price, is that, price of that is there's actually a dystopian element in there who have to come and, 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 you know, call out the, the babies. And so, um, there's a price to be paid for, for this, you know, wonderful utopian life. Right. Well, like the big concern I always have when you have no children being born is that how are you going to have political progress? Because it seems like mm-hmm. people, you know, get to a certain age and they don't, you know, like 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 young people tend to always have more enlightened progressive politics than older people. And if there are no young people coming up, moving up into society and becoming a, mm-hmm. you know, a significant percentage of that society, is the politics just going to stagnate forever? Mm-hmm. 
Well, I wonder if that's true though. If you're if you actually have immortality on the table, because I, I like I feel like part of the stagnation is the sense that um, that you know, like okay, well, I'm I'm only thinking about things because it in this way because I only have to worry about you know. 20 more years and then I'm going to be dead and I don't care as much. And so, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe that's not, maybe that's not most politicians or most, you know, people, but I feel like a lot of the people who make decisions that govern most of us end up thinking that way. And, and I wonder if, if, if everyone's actually immortal or if most people are immortal, if, if that kind of stagnation would still continue or not. But it's an interesting question. I mean, I hadn't really considered that that the, the, the new people being born are the ones that tend to drive the change. But yeah, it definitely is true. There's something in the story about having dead eyes. You know, they they are um, doing this for so long that they stop seeing things. That, And I think it's that element is certainly in the story that without without injection of, of new life and, and change, um, we become somewhat blind, um, blind to the world. We have so many ideas about what immortality would be like or should be like or, or how it would actually be and, and absolutely no way of testing it. <laughs> well, I'm willing to volunteer if anyone I've, has I, I've always been willing to volunteer. Like this whole thing, oh, you wouldn't want to be immortal because you'd get bored with life. It's like, mm -hmm. I will totally test that hypothesis. Yeah, I'm yeah, really yeah. on board with that. That's a really interesting point, though, that maybe if people knew that they were going to live for a thousand years, they would do something about climate change because they're like, oh, crap, yeah, I'm going to have yeah, to I don't know. suffer the consequences. Yeah. I mean, I would think that like even people like who have these these shriveled up calcified hearts, uh, they must they, most of them have families. They must care that their families will have a world, uh, you know, if they have grandkids or whatever you know it's like they must care about them you would think but it, I, I don't know it well seem like it, they do. It, it, not to get too harsh there but a lot of them they're not thinking about earth at all you know they're thinking about god oh, and the bible yeah, and all heaven, this other yeah. stuff so yeah they i think even if they did think that mm. you know and, and a there are people who just don't think that things are really all that bad um but yeah i think there's i think some of them don't really care what happens to planet earth because um, mm -hmm. that's not what they're looking at right and it's like but the rest of us have to live here come on <laughs> you know <laughs> but if they were going to live for a thousand years before going to heaven maybe mm -hmm. they would be thinking more know. about planet earth i don't yeah. know <laughs> i did want to pick up on something we were talking about with carrie just a second ago where i feel like we need to mention that uh, I, I think the statistic, I could be wrong, but it's something along these lines that the United States is 4% of the world's population and uses 50% of the resources. It's something yeah. crazy like wow. that. And so that um, I think a lot of Americans don't care. Like, I, I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, I just feel like they just feel like, oh, everyone should just do, should just live like me and that would be fine. It's like, no, if everyone was living like you, we would need six Earths or something to support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and nobody wants to give up their car or their internet mm -hmm. um or you know their nice house or yeah it, it's it's a big question and well but and, see see everyone could have internet though because well everyone does yeah everyone the, could the, have the, a giant virtual phone. reality house you know they yeah. just have to give, give oh, up yeah. the idea of not of, you know of, of consuming so many more resources than yeah. is sustainable we we have to have our quinoa when we want it <laughs> Yeah, so that uh, this scenario that you're talking about, Dave, of, of you know Americans using so many more resources, um, that that just makes me think of this uh, this story called "Followed" by Will McIntosh. Uh, I reprinted it in The Living Dead. Um, so it, it's like kind of a cheat to call it a zombie story, but I, but it's close enough. But it's like in this. So uh, these these like dead kids start following around people, and and it's like only uh, only only if you've done something bad do you get like these dead kids following you. So like you know people who are like a ruler of a country or something, and they uh, wage a war, like they'd have a whole army of dead people following them around and and like you know plaguing them. Um, and so the protagonist ends up with one, or maybe he had more than one. I can't recall, but 
but he's like, he's like, but I'm a good person. And I do all this, all, I do all these things uh, that are good for people. And, and, and I never hurt anyone, but he has this, this person. And, and it kind of like brings up these issues of, 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 you know, resource, you know, how, how many resources do you use? Like, it's like, oh, like maybe, maybe you're not, maybe you're not recycling enough. Maybe you're not doing this. It's like, well, even as, even as much as you can try to be like a good person or do right for the world, it's like, you're still, you know, maybe using up more resources than you should be, or you're doing, you're, 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 you're not doing enough good, or you're, you're still doing too much bad given, you know, uh, what you're due uh, as, as a member of this world, you know? So are there stories like this, uh, John? I feel like there must be, but I remember actually I was, ta- I, I was talking to TC Boyle about this when I was taking his class at USC, but we were saying that doesn't it make sense to miniaturize human beings as much as possible, right? <laughs> because it should, could you just genetically engineer people to just be as physically small as possible, Funny you mm-hmm. should say that. There's a movie coming out this uh, yes. Christmas called Downsides. <laughs> I think oh. is it Matt, Matt Damon, where people are are being people can't afford to live at the scale that they've been living, so that they, yeah they they get shrunk. Hmm. I only saw like half of a preview, so I can't say very much about it. But there is a movie coming out about that very thing hmm. at the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting idea, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just just shrink everybody down because then the resources will all be magnified because our size is much smaller. And I think they were going to put them all in theme parks yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they have like gated communities, you know, where they could just use less, you know, yeah. <laughs> but still live, live, maintain their lifestyle. Yeah, I agree. I feel I feel like there must be some stories on that topic, but no, uh, nothing comes to mind immediately. I feel yeah. like maybe Rudy Rucker did something or, or something like that, but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, comes to mind. Well, right. And speaking of the kind of cyberpunk kind of writers like that, obviously, you know, if you could like put somebody inside a computer, you know, transfer somebody's brain into a computer, then you could potentially have trillions and trillions and trillions of people all, all on Earth because they're all, you know, the whole planet could just be giant uh, server banks or something. And, mm-hmm. you know, everyone's just existing digitally. Yeah, well, that I think I, I've seen many versions of that one. I'm, I'm trying to remember right off the top of my head was in Ready Player One was overpopulation a big part of that, mm-hmm. or was it just that everybody was living in these stacked up trailer slums? Hmm. I've only seen the trailer, but I think that's what <laughs> it said in the trailer was that it okay. was because of overpopulation. But what about the book? Was the was it dealt with very much? Because my feeling is in the book that that the reason why so many people were living in virtual reality is because. Uh, you know, A, they didn't have resources, and B, that mm-hmm. there was overpopulation. I just couldn't remember to what extent the yeah. book talked about that. Yeah, I don't remember. That would make sense, though. Mm-hmm. But yeah, technology. Uh, so I've seen statistics where the number one thing you can do to reduce your carbon footprint is not have kids. Mm. Mm. That makes sense. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, well, and, and it's like it's a huge, you know, like, like, like of, of the things you can do, it's like recycle or like yeah. get an electric car, or like whatever. They don't make that much difference. And then, mm-hmm. like, not having kids is like huge, huge, a huge, right. huge effect. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like the it's like the same thing. Where like when you look at a budget or something, you're like, oh well, I could cut I could cut uh, my Netflix subscription or whatever, it's like, oh, like eight dollars. Like, well, cut the kid out. Of the like, there you go. There's all your savings. So. But I feel like people, like people's individual choices, like don't make a gigantic difference that what really people need to do is uh, get involved in politics in a way that the whole society makes changes. Like if we were to, yeah. you know, if I personally uh, put solar panels on my house or something, it doesn't make that much mm-hmm. of a difference. But if I can get together with a whole bunch of other people and we all vote to just transform from a fossil fuel economy to a renewable energy economy, that makes a big, mm-hmm. big difference. Well, right. and, and it's happening. But it's if you look at some of the statistics that that wind and solar power are rapidly becoming cheaper um, than than more traditional. You know, so it, it, economics is going to solve that problem eventually, um, and that's that's part of the idea of social engineering. We need to get to a point. And right now, what we have are we have a bunch of people who who really want to make changes, and then we have that that dude with the truck where he puts on the thing that actually belches out more black smoke and emissions than than it would otherwise because he's you know doing the big middle finger to all the rest of us you know that's um i feel like that's what we're grappling with now is that we're in this transition point where we we've got a bunch of people who care and then we have a bunch of people who actively don't care because they don't believe the problem or they believe more in their own right to do whatever the heck they want um 
and that's that's back to social engineering and peer pressure and shaming culture you know how how do we fix this i don't know right but i feel like focus like i i despise that guy but i i feel like mm -hmm. focusing on that guy is is sort of a distraction that what we need to focus on is like the billions of dollars in government subsidies that the well, fossil fuel industry gets that constitutes 100 percent of their mm -hmm. profits and that without guy which they is would... emblematic of all the dudes in politics right now who are gutting the epa um you know so it's it's not just that guy it's what that guy represents mm-hmm well, well, I, I think China's making a huge investment in electric cars. And if, you know, the entire China in, you know, how many, many years can, can make that conversion, it will do, you know, a huge service to, to the, to the earth, earth's, um, the health of the earth, right? And, um, you know, China's, you know, the, they're, they're the big, big, um, growth growth economy right now but you know maybe the next place that goes to is africa or wherever it goes to um that they don't go through this sort of industrialization that um that china went through and that we went through you know uh, you know decades ago and, and they can do it in a clean clean way and that will do a lot to save the the, the earth this um atmosphere yeah. There's another um, Netflix, I think it's Netflix thing. It was recommended by our listener, Ted Vishen, but it's called 3%. Mm -hmm. And I didn't yeah, get a I chance to, I didn't get a chance to watch it, but I think yeah. it's like the first Netflix thing made in Brazil, if I have yeah, that right. Yeah, yeah, I watched a couple episodes of it. Oh, so what did you think? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, it's it's kind of like a, through episode two, it's kind of unclear how much it's actually relevant to this topic. I mean, it feels like that's in the background for sure. Like the three percent of the people are pulled from like the, the the masses into this like special facility where they're they're training to get to go to this like great place they call the offshore, which is going to be like a. A, a more of a utopia. I mean, I'm sure it's not. I'm. They're, they're probably getting trained to go do some kind of terrible thing that that we we haven't even glimpsed yet. But um, yeah, I mean the uh, the 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 overpopulation th stuff is basically in the background, and it, and it's like it's kind of um, it kind of feels a little bit um, uh, sort of Hunger Games esque in the sense of that you know they're 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 going through all these different kind of trials and 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 are being pitted against each other and stuff like that. But it's it's pretty good. It's well done. It's um. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird because Netflix, um, the default is, uh, they, they have it set to automatically dub the show instead of have the subtitles, which like doesn't really make sense to me, but, um, but, but it's, it's pretty well done if you can get past the dub thing. Well, what I wanted to mention about that too is that, yeah, the premise is that there's the super overpopulated place and then a couple select people live in the par tropical paradise. And that's mm -hmm. an idea you see a lot in. I mean, it's in Elysium. It's in yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to to a degree in Soil and Green. Just this yeah. idea mm -hmm. that like, if you have overpopulation, it's not going to be just like like in um, Mark of Gideon, where like every room has a hundred people in right. it. There's always going to be the giant palatial estates of the uh, yeah, ultra wealthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, and the whole issue of of being um, worried about overpopulation, I think. Uh, comes out of class issues. So, yeah, it's it's not overpopulation. It's that we have slums, you know, where there are ten people living to a room. Um, mm -hmm. There are always the haves and the have-nots. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. I'm actually curious, Maggie. I mean, I'm, I'm in China. Was the one the, the one child policy applied to everyone, even like high ranking Communist Party members and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, it applies to everyone. And there were no. And, and... Except in some of no... the rural areas, uh, or um, like in Mongolia, where uh, or or with with certain people where the tribes have run out or or facing extinction, then there are some exceptions made. Or if you have a disabled child, sometimes you can apply. But for the most part, it applies to everyone. That's just really interesting to me. That yeah, because I would have expected in every other situation I can think of in the world of something like that, you would expect the rich and the powerful to have special mm -hmm. exemptions for themselves. Yeah, but the, the rich and powerful, if they happen to have a second child, they can pay the fine they, or they can afford oh. to pay the fines, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. There, yeah, so I, in, I pra there in practice, there is, kind of, there is kind yeah. of an yeah. exception then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, speaking of Elysium, though, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I was surprised that I actually liked that movie because I didn't I didn't particularly care for District 9. But 
uh, which which mo- most people did like. But um, you know, I, I I felt like that was like one of the best examples of like a believable example of like the sorts of uh, things that rich assholes would do in the future where everything's so super overpopulated. Oh. I mean, like if you drill down into the details of the of the world and everything, it probably falls apart. I hated but, I mean, that movie. Oh really? I did it. Yes. <laughs> But but I mean the idea the idea of a bunch of rich assholes building a space station and then like building this like you know like walled city basically up there like that seemed totally believable to me um, and and uh, yeah it's like a, I mean the the last sort of quarter of the movie it's like it just turns into a dumb action movie which you know a, a frequent problem um, but uh, but yeah I don't know I I, I was surprised I actually kind of liked it yeah I I thought it was really dumb (laughs) to be (laughs) blunt um yeah it was it was just so clearly an allegory um i i didn't think the problem was overpopulation and there's a racial component to it that the movie itself did not seem aware of that i found um really blatant um yeah it was just it was so obviously a metaphor um and then the metaphor switched like all of a sudden it's not about you know keeping keeping those people away from from the rich people um it suddenly turned into being all about socialized medicine (laughs) and it was really badly plotted um i'm sorry yeah i i didn't like (laughs) the movie at all i couldn't take it seriously enough to look yeah it, it, it was very cyberpunk though i'll give it that uh are there any other things people i want to just mention these are a little outside but um uh, people, uh, listeners recommended Tough Voyaging by George R. R. Martin and The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niffin and Jerry Pornell. And The Moat in God's Eye, I, which both of which I think are really, really good and interesting. The Moat in God's Eye kind of deals with this issue of how does humanity deal with aliens that reproduce much, much faster than we do and would overpopulate any area that they gain access to and drive us, inevitably drive us out. And sort of what steps are we willing to take to prevent that from happening? And then tough voyaging uh, deals with yeah, like to in in what situation are you justified in basically sterilizing um, a population for their own good? So you know they're like both really uh, like big big questions um, in both of those books. I don't oh, know if anyone's no. yeah, I, I'm actually I haven't read either of those. That's a, a hole in my uh, reading experience. But I'm I'm suddenly now thinking of tribbles. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, of, yeah. Of the the alien that reproduces, <laughs> you know, way mm-hmm. way too fast and will fill any any space that, that we happen to bring them into. Mm-hmm. Um, now I hadn't even we thought should of have that had that on our list. Issue. I That's know, right? Can, I hadn't thought of that until yeah, yeah. now. But but yeah, that. Uh, there, there's even a trouble in the new Star Trek. I and we know, didn't... <laughs> and, and and mostly we were also distracted by that trouble that we're sitting there <laughs> thinking we're we're actually saying to each other, why is there only one? Right. Only one. And I was like, <laughs> "This is wrong." Yeah, I know. <laughs> what have they done to that tribble? <laughs> you know, we yeah. actually got a little worried. He found the sterilized tribble. We found the um, one tribble. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I feel like we should we should also before we wrap up uh, talk about Soil and Green a little bit more. Oh, We've yeah, only mentioned yeah. it in passing. I mean, it's obviously one of the classics of the of this uh, genre. Um, I mean, certainly in film. And it's based um, on a Harry Harrison novel uh, called Make Right, Make Right. Room. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like uh, I mean I'd seen this years ago, and and then I rewatched it in order in prep for this panel, and it's like it's actually I I, I it's 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 more watchable than I was expecting it to be, that or than I remembered it to be. Yeah. Like it, it's it, I mean it it tried it tried my patience at several points where I'm like uh okay I'm kind of looking at my phone and stuff, but I mean it's like it holds up pretty well. It does. I think like it's I mean a for movie. a movie of that age. Yeah. Um. And, I mean it's kind of a hilarious place that the movie ends. It's like the entire movie is about. Um, a cop who's trying to figure out like who, uh, how, why this like uh, rich guy died, and it turns out that he discovered the secret of what Swan and Green is, and then it's like then he figures it out, and then he tells us, and then the movie ends, <laughs> and it's like okay, well that's that's a weird place to stop the movie. No, but see, I, 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 see, John, I, yeah. I like that though because yeah. like yeah. the other option is to do a fucking um, what happened to Monday <laughs> thing where you like right. overthrow like two people overthrow the entire society in the last in the third right, act right, right, of the right. movie. Yeah, and yeah, no, no, I, I totally. Time. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it, it feels it feels weird because of what we're accustomed to from other movies, but I kind of, I appreciated the restraint because I'm like, also, it's like, hey, it's like an hour, 38 minutes, perfect. Yep. <laughs> Don't go a minute longer. Like, whereas um, what happened to Monday, I was like, I wish that was an hour and 38 yeah. minutes. <laughs> and uh, plus you it get definitely went on too long. The, the existential horror of realizing yeah. that nothing's going to change, you know, it's, it's right. oh my God, it's this terrible secret. And it's, eh, sorry, guys, <laughs> this is the way it is. <laughs> you know? Right. You know, and maybe, like, I don't know if I'm just a monster or something, but, like, I, I was like, is it really that bad, though? <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like, sure, sauce like, people... Yeah, no, 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 but I mean, like, sure, people should know that Soylent Green is people. I mean, spoiler alert, it's like 30 years old, but, you know, people should people should be aware that Soylent Green is people, but is it really that big a deal? I mean, like, when 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 resources are so scarce and overpopulation is such an issue, and, like, you just need to feed people. Also, um, <laughs> cannibalism. It's like, it doesn't seem that bad. Did you see Snowpiercer? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, which is not... <laughs> well, it, it, if you define overpopulation by how many resources you are, that train is probably overpopulated. But I was reminded mm. of the... Um, uh, you know, they get to the scene where they're just putting bugs into the thing and then turning it into the little the little gel cakes that everybody eats in the, the lower mm. class uh, cars. And we're all sitting there thinking, you know, by the end of the movie, it's like he was so upset about the bugs. Mm-hmm. But he'd been eating people, you know, <laughs> the whole babies taste best thing. We all, there's two kinds of people. There's the people who, who are horrified by that line and the people who just laugh at it. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, it was like, would you rather eat people or bugs? I but, don't know. Mm-hmm. If, you know if I think it's hurt. actually a fact that you could solve like 60% of the world's problems if everyone just ate if bugs. If everyone just ate bugs. And yeah. the thing is, is if you're going to yeah. crunch them up with some soy sauce and a little sugar, you know, they probably wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> Dave, you can say the same thing about if if if, if everyone just ate people. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, that would, that would, honestly, that I'm with I'm with you on population. that, John. I, I yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with you. The, well, there's there's some other problems. There's disease transmission and things like that sure, when you sure, start sure. eating your own kind. But I assume the soil and green process solves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very processed. I want I want to get Maggie back in here because uh, Maggie, I know you watched Soil and Green in preparation for this. Like, do you have any thoughts about that movie? I, I had a no no not really <laughs> just 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 um it felt dated and and um mm-hmm. I had a hard time with him walking into everybody's house and and just started eating everybody's food <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he never seemed to wear his uniform he was always in that really buff looking t shirt and uh I couldn't couldn't uh sometimes get past that but mm-hmm. um yeah it it. It uh, suddenly drove home the idea that uh, you know the the, the overpopulation idea that um, you know you have to look for a a, a food source and and uh, yeah, and the cautionary tale that uh, you know if we run out of food we're eventually <laughs> may have to resort to cannibalism. I guess I'll just mention that, you know, my parents when they were in college went and saw Soylent Green and Silent Running. It was a double feature. And they came home and joined uh, Sierra Club in Planned Parenthood. Oh, and nice. uh, I've always that's always just stuck in my mind as a, a, a wonderful example of the uh, you know, uh, ability of science fiction to mm-hmm. get people thinking about real issues and uh, to take action. Yeah, we, we need we need movies that do that and not turn into mindless action movies. And maybe yeah. that's the issue that we're having now is that. You know, you get a movie like What Happened to Monday, and it's not actually dealing with the issue. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's using it as, as an excuse to do all these uh, kind of very typical action movie kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, there is this one part where at the end of the movie, again, like spoiler warning everything. But so Glenn Close says something like, you'll never know what kind of world we could have had. Yeah. And like, she's such a villain in the movie that it doesn't really land with anything. But I feel like they were they were at least like, you know, I, I wish it, the movie had had at least some implication like maybe this is going to like ruin everything. You know, like the, the heroes, the heroes succeeding is maybe just going to like ruin the whole world. Like I wish there was some sort of overt uh, recognition of that sort of moral complexity to the situation. Well, they're standing in the, at the very last scene is that room with the racks and racks of babies in incubators, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I found a little disturbing Um, (laughs) creepy (laughs) well it was creepy because it's like hey you know where did these babies all come from um we don't really know 
Um, and apparently we have artificial uterine technology um, in this world that all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, and, and what, yeah, it, it's, I, I think the, the movie kind of threw a lot of things at the wall and, uh, and didn't, didn't deal with them. Yeah, because I was trying to think, was it one of these things I was thinking, you know, it'd be more interesting to tell the story from the point of view. I guess that's kind of what um, Fahrenheit 451 or something does. But tell the point of the, tell the story from the point of view of the person who has to make the choice about whether to enforce mm -hmm. this policy or not right. and is dealing mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. grappling with the ethics of it. Right. Yeah. And Pop Squad, too. Yeah. Although he doesn't really grapple with the ethics of it, per se. <laughs> he just kind of does it. But toward the end, he... Yeah, kind I mean, of turned around, he, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a short story. There's only so much you can do in a few thousand sure. words. <laughs> and of course, it's Paolo Bacigalupi, so he just thinks like everything's going to hell. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. All right, cool. So we're pretty much out of time. So I guess uh, any final thoughts, anyone? Uh, I know Maggie. What? Any final thoughts for us here at the end of the show? Uh, not really. <laughs> um. Just um Will you be writing any more about excess males? Um I'm pop playing with this uh the 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 other um unintended consequence of the one child policy, the the girls who were born um illegally outside of the system and I'm I'm sort of playing with that idea to see if um I can get a longer longer piece out of it. Yeah. So that did sound like the most dystopian thing we talked about in the whole panel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those 13 million shadow children. Like, yeah. That was yeah. That's insane. So they think it's the census counted 13, but, you know, people are saying possibly three to two to three times more than that. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's if, this if big black hole. Yeah. Counted, yeah. No. Why is it so hard to count shadow children? I don't see what the big <laughs> problem is. <laughs> well, you know, they're illegal, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, these children, sometimes they're just kidnapped by the police. Oh. They're kidnapped by tra human traffickers. Um, they're, they're, they're not safe. Um, especially they're very young and, um, can't fend for themselves. So, you know, there's many, many reasons why, you know, people yeah. would want to keep them quiet. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. And, and it sounds like that's obviously something a lot of people like me in the United States don't know a lot about. So, you know, telling these kind of stories, I think, can really, bring attention to this, uh, to this issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, certainly very fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, how about Carrie, uh, final thoughts? Um, support good environmental policy, vote in your uh, local elections. Um, sometimes we can do things at the grassroots level that will trickle up, um, and make a difference. So get involved. Yeah, right. And and just in this situation where just access to contraception and things like that oh, are gosh, becoming yes. more and more like this is mm -hmm. totally the Huge. opposite direction that we want to be going as a planet. So, yeah. Uh, OK, John, <laughs> final thought. Yeah, go buy an excess mail and bannerless. Absolutely. I think everyone everyone can agree to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's yeah, a good, good note to end on. Thank you. All right, so we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Carrie Vaughn, and Maggie Shen King. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Good to be here. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Carrie Vaughn, and Maggie Shen King for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Moss1268, who writes, Fantastic podcast. If you love science fiction and fantasy, this podcast is for you. Love to listen to this at work. So big thanks again to Moss1268 for that great review. Special thanks as well to Donald Croyle, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution... You can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, 
Visit GeeksGuideShow.com to learn more about your host. Visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.